I think we're ready to open. Hello to everybody out there in Connecticut. Um, let me start off by saying I'm very, very sorry that I cannot be there. Nothing would please me more than to be able to be there with all you great patriots uh, celebrating and standing up for our rights. Uh, but I've got commitments down here in North Carolina, but believe me, I am with you in spirit. Uh, first off, just let me... Hello to everybody out there in Connecticut. Um, let me start off by saying I'm very, very sorry that I cannot be there. Nothing would please me more than to be able to be there with all you great patriots uh, celebrating and standing up for our rights. Uh, but I've got commitments down here in North Carolina, but believe me, I am with you in spirit. Uh, first off, just let me start by saying thank you to everyone, everybody in Connecticut and all across the country that has supported me and, and, and given me such kind words. It, it means so much to me, and, and I'm just I'm just so pleased that what I said at the city council meeting was able to inspire people, and I hope it will continue to inspire all of us to stand up for our rights. You know, we talk a lot about uh, about the Second Amendment. We talk about how important it is. But the one thing we need to remember in this fight is this, and, and I talked to a group of people about this last night. We really, really, really need to be courageous. These are dark times in our country. We have forces of evil that are trying to do our country no good. And we really need to stand up with courage and proclaim the truth because our Second Amendment is what keeps us safe. It kept us safe during World War II. It kept, it, 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 it kept people safe during the Civil Rights Movement. It keeps Americans safe in their home. The right to protect yourself is a God-given right. And it is our politicians' responsibility as our servants to protect that right. So I want to encourage all of you out there, do not be afraid to stand up for your rights. The Second Amendment, as I said, is, a, is, a, is one of our most important rights, part of our Bill of Rights. But that Second Amendment keeps all the others in place. So again, when you think about speaking up, if you get discouraged, if you feel fear creeping in, what I want you to do is I want you, not, just don't remember my speech. I want you to think back farther than that. Think back to the men who founded this country. Think back to 1775 when the men at Lexington and Concord had to face the most powerful army on earth. And they stood up with courage and conviction and they did it, folks. That's what we've got to do. We've got to put their courage at our backs and we've got to put the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ at our front and we've got to move forward and we've got to fight the forces that are trying to destroy this country. Nothing would please me more than to see millions and millions and millions of people in Connecticut and every other state rise up against the complacent politicians, against the socialist politicians, and run them out of office to let them know that we are the majority and our voices are what and our voices and our hard work is what makes the wheels go round and round in this country and we are we want our we want our rights and we want to be respected. So to all of you there, I, I say stand up. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Be the majority. Make your voices heard. Do it with courage and conviction. Thank you very much. And again, I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I'm with you in spirit. Go Connecticut. From North Carolina, that was Mark Robinson. All right, at this time, I would like uh, to the crowd to part a little bit, and I would like to call up Dana Patikas and the Oath Keepers. Here they come. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, Patriots. Good morning. Ooh, 
hurrah. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about the Oath Keepers. Then we're going to offer people an opportunity to take the oath or renew your oath if you've already taken one. So I'm going to give you a quick, quick rundown about Oath Keepers uh, straight from our sheet here, and then we'll get to it. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of currently serving military, reserves, National Guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us, to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, so help us God. The oath is to the Constitution, not to the politicians, not to any particular political party. In the long-standing tradition of the U.S. military, we are apolitical. We don't care if unlawful orders come from a Democrat or a Republican, or if the violation is bipartisan. We will not obey unconstitutional and thus unlawful and immoral orders, such as orders to disarm the American people or to place them under martial law. We won't just follow orders. That being said, if you would like to take the, the oath for the first time or to renew an oath that you've already taken, please take a step forward towards the front of the crowd. And if you don't wish to take the oath or renew your oath, stand back and let the Patriots do it. Okay. If you're taking the oath, please Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, your name, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Congratulations. anybody 21 or under, I would like to call them up right now to join us with the National Anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Kylie, come on up here. Oh, she needs that microphone. Kylie, come on over here to the microphone. Anybody who is under 21, they're trying to steal your rights, particularly if you're 18 to 21. Come on up here and join us if you want to. This is our next generation, people. This is why we are here today. Let's make sure that the children have the same rights that we had. Okay. 
Carly, would you sing the national anthem? Everybody, we're back. There we go. Kylie, would you please sing the national anthem? Okay, kids, stand here, and Elsie is going to lead us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have any legislators here who support the Second Amendment that are elected to office right now? If you're a legislator that supports the Second Amendment, come on up here right now, please, and stand with me over here. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our legislators that support us here at the Capitol, and, and they need your support. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as the day goes on. But I want to send a, a tremendous thank you out to them for standing up and defending our Second Amendment rights for the years that they've been serving at the Capitol here. So let's give them a thank you. Find them.
Greg Fishbein from the 90th District. I represent Cheshire and Wallingford. Dave Wilson from the 66th, Warren, Litchfield, Morris, Bethlehem, and Woodbury. Scott Storms from the 60th. I represent Windsor and Windsor Locks. Greg Stokes from uh, the 58th in Infield. Anybody from Infield here? All right. Rob Sampson, the 80th District of Connecticut, Wolcott and Southington. Doug Dubitsky, 47th District, which is Chaplin, Hampton, Scotland, Lebanon, Lisbon, Canterbury, Sprague, Norwich, and Franklin. My name is Roger Sherman, and I'm an alderman from Waterbury here. Semper Fi and hoorah. All right, thank you guys very much. And we're going to hear a, a little bit more from a couple of those legislators in uh, just a few. So off we go. I want to take a moment to thank each one of you for coming out and joining us on this beautiful day today. Let me also take a, a moment to thank the hardworking executive committee members of the Connecticut Citizens Defense League and the volunteers for helping pull off this rally on such an incredibly short notice. Let's give them a hand. Thank you guys and gals. Now, we have witnessed the politicization of mass shootings in recent years from Columbine to Sandy Hook, from Aurora to Orlando, and of course many others as well. We have seen more attacks on our civil liberties, our Second Amendment rights, than ever before. We have heard the drumbeat grow louder and bolder by those who would eradicate and repeal our right to keep and bear arms. I could not help but notice that during several of the so-called school safety rallies which took place last month, that mixed in with the good families who were genuinely concerned about the safety of their children, there were people there, and they were carrying signs that said things such as, yes, we are coming for your guns. Repeal the Second Amendment. And, it, and some of them even said, kill the NRA. That's why we are here today. Every time, there is a horrific murder. Opportunistic politicians run to the microphones and cameras. Two of the very big ones come right from here in our own state. Should, I wasn't sure, should I name them? One of them is Richard Blumenthal. And the worst of those two is Chris Murphy. And through the commentary that they provide, their solutions only seem to include proposals that would deter, curtail your rights as free citizens. Not for a second will these policymakers consider alternative proposals that deviate from an ideology that is rooted in gun control. Time and again, innocent children and adults have been brutally murdered in cold blood, and certain Connecticut politicians, we already named them, point in our direction. These politicians foment hostilities and pit citizens against citizens by ratcheting up their poisoned rhetoric. On a different note, I truly wish I could be standing here today and tell you that our Second Amendment rights are stronger than ever, that we are winning the battle against gun control. While I am in many ways an optimist, I can only stand here today and report the truth. Here it is. We have endured, endured eight years under Governor Malloy. We have had struggle after struggle since the murders in Sandy Hook. We have had certain legislators, already named them, not even consider the constitutionality of what laws they pass. We write them, we call them, 
and we come here to testify. Occasionally, we do win a battle, here or there. It feels really good when we win those battles, but we must never give up. Should we do so, we would be accepting a fate far worse than any struggle we may now endure. No nation is invincible. The ability to exercise our right is not guaranteed in perpetuity. As our rights decline and are watered down, future generations will surely lose any notion of what it is to be an American. Our children and our grandchildren will never know the freedoms that we today now have. It's up to us. It is up to you who are standing here today to do what needs to be done. The only path to ending this nonsense is to change what we do. Join us in the battle. Help good candidates win races. Help proven legislators, some who already came up and introduced themselves, hold their seats. Email your lawmakers and tell them to stop passing bad gun laws. Even though the Second Amendment is written on parchment from long ago and resides in the halls of Congress, the only guarantee to protect our rights resides solely within you and me. Our reality today is only the beginning. The real work begins at about 1 o'clock today, at the conclusion of this rally. Right now, this is all about our children and our grandchildren and the future of their rights. So let us do our part and lead the way. OK, up, uh, I would like to bring up Holly Sullivan, who is our event coordinator. I'd like to give her a big hand and welcome her to the microphone. Thank you. I am tremendously humbled by how many of you I see here today. And thank you for answering our call and for standing together. When speaking of the Federalists in his inaugural address in 1801, Thomas Jefferson said, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are the same here together. We may not always share the same opinions on all things such as bump stocks, but we are united in our unwavering conviction to preserve the Second Amendment. So make no mistake, they have promised when they give us that inch, the bump stock ban, we will take a mile. Well, we are here to say that the mile is not theirs for taking. We have a duty to protect the Second Amendment, not just for ourselves, but for our children. You see, they may say it's a small sacrifice to be made for the safety of our children. Yes, we agree there is nothing more important than protecting them. However, we look at the most heinous travesties throughout history, and they were when the masses had no means and no right to self-defense. To take away the American birthright is to take away the American future, to take away from our children the freedoms we have known, to jeopardize future generations' claims to the nation we have been blessed to have been given. I am a mother of a four-year-old child. She is my world. She is my heart. She's my everything. I do not love my child any less because I support the Second Amendment. Despite how the other side may want to portray me, I believe that she and her future offspring are ent entitled to be left with the same intact Bill of Rights that American generations before her depended on to secure their freedoms. The right to gather today as we are doing, the right not to be enslaved, the right to vote, the right to protect themselves and their families by bearing arms. What parent would want any less for their children? However, 
When speaking of our rights, we would be remiss not to mention our rights as citizens of Connecticut, the Constitution State. Our state constitution clearly states in section 15, every citizen has the right to bear arms of defense and the state. In what instance can I defend the state against external threats with a six round revolver? Or no firearms at all? That is their mile, that is their goal. So it's time to step up, hold our state accountable to unfulfilled promises, increase school security, funding for mental health. We as gun owners did our part in 2013. We cannot stand for more miles of hours being taken while they are still measuring their obligations in inches. So I return to Thomas Jefferson. He said, I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. As we stand before this great building, As we stand before this great building, the capital of the people of Connecticut, I call on you to have an increased presence here beyond just today. We may stand here unified today, but we have, must have a unified presence every day. Make no mistake, but behind these walls are where the future American reality will be determined. We have the power as the people to say what kind of state and what kind of country we will leave for our children. And yes, that means sacrifice, sacrificing our time and giving our voices. However, should we fail, that mile will never be returned. All right, thank you. That's our event coordinator today, uh, Holly Sullivan. I want to thank her for her speech. And uh, we're going to just roll right now. Um, I'd like to call up, uh, and I want to make a statement as regarding any legislators that are speaking today. If they're running for office, they're not here as candidates for office. They're here as proven legislators that have proven to stand and support our Second Amendment rights here and have a proven track record of it. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our one-time general counsel for CCDL before he decided to run for office, I don't know how happy I am about that still, but I'm happy he, at least he's, he's here in Hartford. Please help me welcome from the 90th House District, uh, Craig Fishbein. Good morning. You would think, you know, this is a gun rally, there's not going to be any fluff, but I brought you a poem. Listen, O oh citizens, and you shall hear the quiet murmur of voices all the way to the rear. On the 14th of April in 2018, a rally at the Capitol to fight the anti-gun machine. The right to defend is one inherent at birth, a God-given right as we all walk this earth. Our founding fathers knew this, and thus they did pass the Second Amendment so that their future would last. Even here in Connecticut, the Constitution state our descendants adopted language without much debate, which is even clearer than that written for the U.S. Article 1, Section 15, which language I address. Every citizen has a right to defend himself and this state, an empowering statement so clear and straight. There can be no confusion as to what it really meant, nor the harms and destructions it was intended to prevent. But yet, as with most things that are in this world, there are detractors and refuters with their flags unfurled, claiming in whisper it is best to ban all the guns. Little by little they take, while also hiding their fun. So true it is, too, in the building behind me, year upon year within it, the debates they remind me, that the true ulterior motive behind all the legislation is not good faith public safety, but rather rights bastardation. Yeah. 
They do not care how or what they attack, so long as it is guns, they do not hold back. And so it is time for all of us here today to tell them no more, no more, no more, no way. And remember, when it comes around to next fall, when you all vote for who will be in this hall, I hope that you will research and look at their past and see if they stand with your rights unsurpassed. If not, then I ask you to challenge and debate about the founding of this country, or maybe even this state. And when they tell you the second must only mean a musket, take the logic to speech, and they know they are busted. <laughs> For if our founding fathers merely envisioned so far as to extend the right only to the guns of folklore, then surely the internet they could not see back then, and thus the right to speech must have long ended, my friend. That logic I trust they will not be able to handle. They will call you names and they will ramble. Just remember this side can never be beaten because in the end we are on the side of freedom. And so at this time, I'm closing this poem. But please, all you people, do not yet go home. There are plenty of others that follow me here today, rallying together, shooing the anti-gunners away. Thank you, and God bless America. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, we're looking for Susan Ross. Is she here? Yeah. Where are you? Susan! Susan? Okay. We sent out a memo for the speakers to check in. Oops. And not break WFSP's microphone. Where is she? She's coming. Here we come! Hey. Late but still here. Everybody, let's give a huge welcome to Susan Ross. Moodis, Connecticut! Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me find my speech. Well, as you all know, my name is Susan Ross. I'm a proud CCDL member. A member of the NRA, I'm an NRA instructor, I compete in various disciplines, and I'm a member of two of the local clubs. I graduated from University of Hartford with a criminal justice degree, summa cum laude, and have gone on to a grad school. I also work full time for a Fortune 500 company, and they seem to trust me. When I first decided to get my permit, like many others, it was because of a scary incident. It happened to me one night at home, and if anything were to have escalated, I would not have had any way to protect myself. I knew then that it was time. So I contacted a friend of mine, and he and I both took a class with Brian Stesla, and we got our permit, and two weeks after I got my permit, I shot my first match. Not only was it fun, but it was great practice how to safely use my firearm. Enough about me. I want to tell you some of the reasons we all carry and we all should carry. Here are some stats that we need to be mindful of. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 
As of 2016, 1.3% of all persons aged 12 and older experienced one or more violent victimizations. Stranger violence is higher than the rate of intimate partner violence right now at 8.2 per thousand. Intimate partner violence is at 2.2 per thousand. Human trafficking has become a global issue. According to the International Labor Organization, it estimates that there are 20.9 million victims of human trafficking globally with hundreds of thousands in the United States. These are just a few statistics that we should all be aware of. Any of these could affect any of us at any given time. On the flip side though, according to a CBC study, self-defense can be an important crime deterrent. This was a $10 million study commissioned by President Obama shown in the CNS News July 17, 2013. Wonder why we never heard about this. The study goes on to say, studies that directly assess the effect of actual defensive uses of guns, i.e. incidents in which a gun was used by the crime victim in the sense of attacking or threatening an offender, have found consistently lower injury rates among gun-using crime victims compared to victims who used other self-protective strategies. The CDC study was entitled Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. Thank you, Scott. Even the CDC agrees with us. But how are guns used as a deterrent? Is it merely showing someone that we have one? One article I read stated that there's a disagreement as to how to measure how a gun is used as a deterrent. The extent and nature of defensive gun use as a deterrent is quite complex. There are many, many studies done out there that are just inconclusive as to how many actual times guns have been used as a deterrent and how they have been used as a deterrence. Guns have been used just over 116,000 times according to the National Criminal Victim Survey. Compared to a survey done by the National Self-Defense Survey, which found guns used as a deterrence approximately 2.5 million times. I can quote statistics all day, but what this is really about are rights to personal protection the same rights afforded to our politicians, to the Hollywood crowd, to those who are in the spotlight. They all have armed security detail. Why do they have guards armed with guns? Because the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Remember, I am my own first responder. I am my own personal protection. Carry on. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Susan Ross. Thank you. Okay, up next, we're gonna keep this thing rolling. Let's raise those flags again. That's how our rallies are. USA! 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 Okay. Okay, up next, uh, this is gentleman is a longtime activist who really oftentimes works behind the scenes doing things, but he is he makes sure that he does the little things like make sure that, that the club he's a part of is involved in this fight for, for Second Amendment rights. Uh, and he's been, uh, I'd like to consider him a dear friend at this point, although I've never told him before now. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Don Basile. Hey everyone. Uh, 
great day. Uh, now that I've entered the more senior demographic of the gun community, Scott asked me to talk to you a little bit about the more contemporary history of gun control in our state. Uh, I, my name is Don Basil. I've been a lifelong resident of Connecticut. Even when I went away to school, I chose to stay here in Connecticut. And I've also been a lifelong gun guy. And that's not too much of a stretch, because uh, I vividly remember when I was only in fourth grade, making the conscious decision that when I got old enough, I was going to buy myself a Browning High Collar. Uh, I'm going to fast forward to the very late 80s. There was a mass shooting in Stockton, California. Our then sitting president, Bush Sr., both a Republican and an NRA member, initiated a gun ban. This is when I woke up. This is when my eyes opened. This is when I got active. My government was, telling, was punishing me for something that I had nothing to do with. My government was reprimanding me for the actions of a total stranger 3,000 miles away. Now, when I went away to school my freshman year, I was a history major, so I studied history. There was one way to get out of taking any math courses. <laughs> but I learned things, and I learned that collective punishment is very un-American. It's actually a Marxist ideology. In America, we believe in individual freedoms and liberties. And with that, we believe in individual responsibility and accountability. Well, I got off the couch and I started becoming more active. Uh, back then, this was long before the inception of CCDL, there was an organization called the Coalition of Connecticut Sportsmen, and it was headed by Bob Crook. Good. Bob was almost literally a one-man army here in the Capitol. He put in very long hours fighting for, fighting the good fight, fighting for our rights. We are all greatly indebted to Mr. Crook because, believe me, we would have been a lot worse a lot sooner had it not been for his dedication and also the personal sacrifice that his family made so that he could be here instead of with them. The late 80s was also when the anti-rights movement really started to gain momentum. And there was a catchphrase that was being thrown around very flippantly. It was assault weapon. And the purpose of that was twofold. One, it was to give a very negative connotation to the firearm. And number two, it was purposely done to blur the definition of assault weapon and confuse the general public that weren't that well-educated on the topic. Well, we in the gun community were asleep at the wheel. We allowed that to happen. We did not cry foul. We did not throw a flag on the play. And that negative connotation, that terminology began to fester. And a few years later, we had the assault weapon ban. I was going around to various gun clubs, explaining to everyone how onerous this legislation was, and back then, they literally turned their backs on me. If it didn't affect their prized parazzi, they couldn't have cared less. And we got the assault weapon ban. We fought it at the Litchfield Courthouse, our then Attorney General, Richard Blumenthal. <laughs> stuck a Tech 9 with a 32 round stick mag under his suit coat and went around arguing that it was concealable. It's concealable. And everybody laughed because it looked like he had a dorsal fin. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the only funny thing I could say about that entire nightmare. <laughs> Fast forward another 20 years and Sandy Hook happens. And we get hit with some very bad legislation. You may remember, the first of which was 
uh, a gun control dream list called 1076, and then after that was SB 1160. And again, assault weapon gets blurred and misused, and now we're living under the law of the land where my five shot, 22 caliber target pistol, Olympic style target pistol, had to be registered as an assault weapon. And yet the other side of the fence are the ones that claim that they're the voice for reason and common sense. To me, the most onerous component of SB 1160 is actually the universal background check component and the way it's implemented. It's fundamentally flawed. Think about it. Every time now we want to purchase a firearm, we have to ask the state government, the state police, for permission to do so. We have to get an authorization. Without their authorization, there is no sale. You cannot. You cannot uh, you know, use your Second Amendment right and purchase that firearm. Well, think about it. The fundamental flaw with that is whenever you're forced into a position where you have to ask the government for permission to do something each and every time you want to do it, you've lost it as a right. What we had was a Second Amendment right. What they now gave us is a privilege. They, they take a solemn oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution, not to subvert it and not to eradicate it, and when they break their oath of office, they betray the public trust. The Second Amendment empowers us greatly, and to be very succinct about it, that gun in my hand empowers me with the ability to say no. No, you can't come into my home. No, you can't hurt me. No, you can't hurt my family. That's pretty much it, cut and dry. Whether or not I choose to exercise that ability is still my prerogative. The primary purpose of the Second Amendment is to act as the guardian to the entire Constitution. It gives the Bill of Rights its teeth. Therefore, to me, there's inherent bond between the amendment that, whose sole purpose is to protect the very same document that a, an elected official is sworn to defend. So I can understand why any politician would ever want to do anything to weaken the Second Amendment. Now we have the Parkland shooting. And the same tactic that they used with assault weapon, because it's tried and true, they're doing it again to us now. And it's with the word shooter. The shooter killed 17 people. The shooter went on a murderous rampage. They're giving the word shooter a very negative connotation, making it synonymous with the word murderer. I call flag on the play. I'm insulted by that. I'm offended by that, because I'm a shooter. Just like that, guys, a golfer. That guy's a skier, I'm a shooter. And even worse, if I go to the range a lot and I shoot a lot, that makes me an active shooter. Well, now they've done so much and they've banned so many firearms from us from the list that now it's gotten so ridiculous that there aren't that many guns left for them to ban. So now they're going after a butt stock or a hunk of plastic or metal. Uh, it, it's getting quite ridiculous. But how did we get to this point? How did we get from that fourth grade kid that was planning on buying a Browning High Power when he got older to this old bald guy now that can't even buy a Browning High Power for his collection with the original magazine? How did we get from there to here? A lot of it has to do with the anti-constitutional legislators. A lot of it has to do with uh, the anti-freedom movement. But to be honest with you, where I lay blame the most, our biggest adversary is apathy. We have the numbers. None of this stuff ever should have happened. We have the numbers. 
We have the numbers at the, on election day. We have facts. We have historical precedents. We have everything in our favor. They only have emotion and ignorance to prey on. So I'll wrap this up real quick. So now what do we do? We're all here today, it's a beautiful day, it's awesome. What do we do after today? Please, I know I'm preaching to the choir, so forgive me for that, but get active. Do you know your legislators? And just as importantly, do they know you? All of my state and federal legislators know me on a first name basis. I don't think any of them are happy about that, but all of them know me on a first name basis. And I, and I let them know how I feel and I watch how they vote. And when they vote against me, I let them know my disappointment. And it works the other way too. When they vote with me, I, I say thank you. And if, they, and if they do their job properly, come election time, I don't wait for them to ask me. I step forward, what do you want me to do? I give them money, I get other people to give them money, I stuff envelopes, I knock on doors, whatever it, they need, I do. So I'm gonna wrap this up right now. Okay, and I'm gonna, yeah, I've talked enough. Thank you, you've been very gracious with your time. Thank you. Heed the words of Don Vasile, everybody. Hey, let's raise those flags one more time, come on. Are you pissed off? Me too. There's an eagle. There's an eagle in the sky. All right. We are being guarded. Okay, does anybody want to hear from a high school student? A high school student that was nearly denied the opportunity to speak out against gun control walkouts in her school? Well, here she is, right now, Ashley Dummett from Farmington, Connecticut. Hi. Fellow patriots, I stand here today honored to have my voice heard, yet fearful for our great nation. All around us, there are people advocating to repeal the Second Amendment with little to no knowledge about the cause that they are actually fighting for. Gun control on the surface may seem like a great solution to our country's problems, but when you analyze it with the least amount of common sense, it would only lead to tyranny. With this na when this nation was founded, careful consideration was put into the process to ensure liberty for all. Anti-federalist activists like Thomas Jefferson strived for the Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution to prevent the government from oppressing the rights of the people. Thus, the perfect balance between order and freedom was formed. The creation of a Constitution happened in 1787. It is now 2018 and our country is in peril. Chaos is emerging as the result of children dying tragically by the insane. There have already been multiple school shootings this year, with 317 happening last year alone. With these massacres happening almost as many times as there are days in the year, it is no wonder why people are upset. However, those that believe guns are the issue are missing many components of common sense. Before Columbine, school shootings almost never took place. These horrific events primarily erupted in the past 30 years, indicating that there has been a change in society. With these tragedies increasing each year, gun laws have become stricter, only for the numbers to keep rising. We now need to address these issues properly in order to prevent further lives from being lost. Every school shooting has a shooter. The gun did not decide to go on a rampage by itself. For once a blame shoot, Guns for shootings is like blaming cars for drunk driving accidents. The operator is solely to blame. Now, it may be confusing why a teenage girl is standing here as a speaker to those who do not know my story. I am the silenced majority. 
I am the kids that are shut down whenever we try to speak up for what is right. I am the kids who said no to the school walkouts on March 14th. I am part of this country's future, here to defend our Constitution in every opportunity presented. When I heard the news that my school was going to have an assembly on the day of the walkouts, I immediately rushed to action to make sure that it would be bipartisan. My political views were then quickly shut down by restricting me to speak that day, but I did not give up there. I fought as hard as I could to put a stop to the assembly's political agenda, and I succeeded. The youth of our nation needs to stop being afraid and take a stand. We are the future of this nation, and its fate rests in our hands. We must defend the ideals of our founding fathers at all costs, regardless of the consequences from those that oppose us. With every step back, we must push back harder than ever in order to ensure that our life, liberty, and property will never be taken away from us. If the Second Amendment were to be repealed, our nation would fall into chaos. With one right being stripped from our hands, there will be nothing to stop people from further restricting our rights. So I ask you today, as a 16-year-old girl, who fears for the state of this nation, do not allow this to happen. Use your voice, take to the polls in November, and fight for our freedoms guaranteed in the Constitution. We stand here today united as the silent majority, the ones that need to raise up and let our voices be heard. The other side is doing so, and if we do not do so, we will fall into tyranny upon our nation. So I thank you for being here today to support the Second Amendment. Actions like these are needed to show that we are still here and that we cannot be silenced. After today, we must continue to use our voices to ensure the Constitution will never be infringed upon. Thank you. because, you know, through the years of the founding of this organization, back in, way back in only 2009, um, we've had a number of people come, and some stayed and served for a while, and some left, and we always are, are you know, seeking to, to find the, the people that uh, seem to not want to uh, get into a, a brawl of some kind with each other as we, you know, work behind the scenes with our committees to, to make sure that things keep running with the organization. And uh, so uh, we have, uh, I guess uh, she's been involved, but this is really our, our newest uh, member of our executive committee. She's been with us for a while now. And she had specifically said, you know, I want to come out and talk about what I want to talk about, about how I got involved with fighting for gun rights and joining the organization and becoming an executive member. Um, so, and she also has uh, personal stuff that she would like to talk about. So please help me welcome. Uh, to the podium, Chris Witherall, membership coordinator for CCDL. I moved to Connecticut a few months before Hurricane Irene. My husband was given a great job opportunity, and I saw it as a way to make my family more complete. You see, my ex-husband lives in New Hampshire, and I had to share our son since our divorce. I figured six and a half hours closer, this will make things easier. I was wrong. My ex was advised to watch my movements after I won a custody battle. He was told to wait, I would move again. What he knew and I didn't was I had 10 days to register my custody agreement, or it would become unenforceable. Now that I could understand, let's fight it out again. I'd win again. But he didn't stop with that. My husband filed an ex parte order against me. The clerk agreed with him that my move, the third in eight years, would negatively affect my son's healthy psyche. Ex parte granted. 
No judge, no hearing. Some woman who had never met me determined I was an immediate threat to my son. Now, if he lived in Connecticut or I lived in New Hampshire, this would not have been so hard. HB 5054 had not been brought to committee, it had not been voted into law, and it had not been signed. He lives in a state where the out-of-state party does not have to be notified when an ex parte order is granted. I was loose in custody of my son, and no one had the decency to send me a letter. If this happened five years later, I would have been committing a felony with no knowledge. I would have been walking around thinking I was fine, upstanding, law-abiding, hand-bend-carrying citizen. But you know what? Um, oh, sorry. It's me, those like me, a woman traveling by plane, and we're the ones that get busted, not the criminals. When 5054 was in committee, I was a brand new member of CCDL. I sat for nine hours. When it was my turn, they listened, they asked questions, they thanked me, and in the end, I didn't think it mattered. Um, sorry. It changed nothing because of who has been voted in, uh, but I wish that was the end of my story. Sadly, it's not. Previous is about what could have happened. Following is what did. So a long time ago, I was diagnosed with PTHD, anxiety and depression, due to surviving uh, severe abuse at the hands of someone who claimed to love me. Over the next decade and a half, I denied myself treatment for one reason or another, whether it be stigma against mental health, career limiting, pharmaceuticals, or just the limiting factor of an unsupportive family. I was reluctant and I hid. Finally, in April of 2016, it all just became too much. My family asked me to seek help, and I did. I was two days in my in treatment, and my husband had to come and ask for my permit. Because like a good permit holder, I had it with me. So I had to check out my belongings because I was, in, I was inpatient, and I had to hand over my permit. This was a particularly rough day, and I was looking forward to a visit with my family, but, you know, didn't really pan out. After I was discharged, the police came to my house looking for me. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, my husband informed me that I had 72 hours to relinquish my permit or I'd be committing a class C felony, or a class C misdemeanor, excuse me. No, class A, because 1160 boosted it up from class C. So instead of visiting with my husband, who had to travel two hours every day to come see me, to show me that he supported me, I had to give up, you know, something that I had accomplished. The permit process is long. We feel accomplished when we get, you know, the permit. So I was discharged, like I said, with a letter stating that I was not a risk to myself or others. I went home to see my kids after four days of them praying for me, drawing me pictures, and after only speaking to me on the phone to find a letter stating that I had to turn over my firearms, of which they had a list. The next six months were pretty grim. I'd gotten used to the idea that I could defend myself should the need arise. Until that October, I could not. I had to help myself, a lot of people do. I was not a member of CCDL, Back with the public hearings for this, uh, back when the public hearings for this bill were taking place, maybe if I kept myself better informed, more active in an organization whose sole purpose is to educate and assist, I would have, I wouldn't have spent six months looking over my shoulder in fear instead of my usual vigilance. You know, to wrap this up, I just want to tell you that it's an honor to be invited to speak. Even bigger that you guys listened and supported me. The best way to keep from having to call me and ask me what I did when all this happened to me is participate. When you get the legislative action emails, come to the, build, come to the legislative office building. Sit with us. When your town, districts, state, and even nation carries a vote, vote. 
We can make the change happen, but it has to be all of us. All right, let's give her a shout out. Come on. All right, thank you, Chris. You have no idea how much courage it takes to stand up here in front of you. I'm shaking. Um, so, we heard from a high school student. Would we like to hear from a high school student? Okay. We have another gentleman who contacted me literally about a, uh, a week ago or so. And he said, hello, my name is Blank. And I am trying to conduct a school walkout to support our Second Amendment rights. So, Blank was contacted by me. And we had a conversation. And he sounded really, really good. And I said, before I help you with the, with the school walkout, if we can help you with that, I need something else from you. I need you to come here and stand at the Capitol and tell your story about the intimidation that you felt at the hands of certain people that run your school. Our schools should not be used as a political bully pulpit. And if you're a parent and your kid's in school, you should watch what they're teaching them and watch what they're telling them and watch what they're trying to make them do. Not all schools are bad. Not all schools, certainly, from what we have witnessed, are good. So please, let me help, help welcome, uh, I'm going to say his name now, to the podium, Connor Jarmy from North Cranford High School. start, I just want to say that I have never spoke in front of more than 15 people, and there is a lot more than 15 people here. Uh, I don't have much to say, but I just wanted to share what happened on the day of March 14th, the walkout. I said, hi, my name is Connor Jarmy, and I'm a 10th grade student who attends North Bradford High. On March 14th, we had a walkout for the Parkland School shooting. On this day, we are told we were spending 17 minutes outside for the 17 students uh, or victims that were murdered. I didn't think my standing outside in the parking lot would be the best way to honor the lives lost, but the teachers oh, lives lost, but the teachers told us going outside was optional, and if we wanted, we could head to the cafeteria to spend the 17 minutes there. I found out right before the walkout that the news had now reported the walkout's goal was really to demand Congress to pass legislation to keep us safe from gun violence in our schools. Our homes and places of worship. I figured the 17 minutes it was a cover-up for the stricter gun control, but I kept it to myself and looked on the brighter side that we doing this for all the acts of terror, or this horrible act of terror. Uh, so after some hesitation, a good percentage of the class that I was in at the time decided that we were going to spend the 17 minutes in the cap. The announcement came over to the loudspeakers and said that we are going to be going outside for the 17 minutes to show our respect for the Parkland High School, sh school shooting. And if you didn't know to head outside, you would report to the cafeteria. Some other students and I from class, oop, um, from I were on our way to the cafeteria when three teachers stood in the line of the hallway, almost making it seem blocked off. I was so confused, I stopped in the middle of the hallway and asked if I can go to, go to the cap, but she did not respond. I noticed kids near the cap, so me and at least four other students had to physically squeeze, squeeze between the teachers just to get to the cafeteria. They deliberately tried to make us seem um, like it seem and feel like an outsider walking away from the line. This seems far from an optional walkout to me. Our school was built in 1964, so you have to keep in mind how small our hallways are, especially where the three teachers are standing. We should absolutely have the right to voice our opinions in school, uh, but this was yet, another, yet again another liberal agenda being pushed on the students. Once I got to the cafeteria, I could not believe how many students went, were, how many students I was joined by, especially, especially considering how, um, how small my school is. I was joined by about 50 or so students, which surprised me considering obviously how, school, or how small my school is. 
Whether the March 14 walkout was for the lives lost or for stricter gun control, what happened that day was absolutely ridiculous and no student should ever have the feel that he or she needs to walk outside the line to make a difference. Just, just because we are young doesn't mean we be overpowered by others. Remember, Connecticut, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you. He upheld his end of the bargain. Now we gotta help him with the school walkout, I guess. <laughs> to protect our Second Amendment rights. So uh, our next speaker, we're gonna keep this rolling because we're running right along like a like a Swiss clock right now. But I do want to give a shout out to uh, radio station WJJF. That's 949 News Now because they have been especially helpful in promoting this rally in the eastern, southeastern part of the state this past week. All right, Lee Elsie, thank you. 949, thank you. Uh, and uh, here today is one of the weekend hosts who uh, has his own show. So I would like to call him up here now to the podium from the Dan Newmeyer Show. Dan Newmeyer. Yeah. How are you? It's a good day for freedom out here, isn't it? All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Rally for Our Rights. My name is Dan Newmeyer, and I'm a political strategist. I have a radio show on 94.9 News Now, and each week for over a year now, I have been doing an NRA 2A segment with great guests from the NRA and the CCDL to protect the Second Amendment. It's a great honor for me personally to be able to address you. The starting point for any legislation has to be protecting our rights. How can we believe people and politicians swept up in emotion from the latest massacre and pointed by anti-gun groups to protest are in any way capable of making a sound decision about which common use firearms we should be allowed to own. We must be politically active to protect and keep our right to bear arms. We must protect our families from the tyranny of the party in power. Here in Connecticut, we know what tyranny of the party of power has done, and we know how it has brought a great state to its knees. Right? Our tyrant governor up there, Daniel Malloy, and his corrupt party of power continue to subjugate us. They use our children for social engineering experiments and fill their heads with nonsense about giving up their constitutional rights as being okay. It's not okay. Their crushing grip is hurting our precious families. This isn't about race, creed, or color. It's about American citizens getting ripped off by an out-of-control, socialist-driven party in power. The longer this party maintains power, the more they seek control over our lives and to perpetuate the demise of our constitutional rights. They have gutted the middle class, business, and the economy of this state on purpose to give the spoils to their public union puppet masters. They must be voted out. People, vote them out. 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 People and businesses are fleeing real oppression from this out of control leadership and it must change in November. 
It should not be that we must constantly have to be vigilant to tyranny, but it is all around us now. The party in power has built as a built-in workforce that keeps the pain coming to us. The public employee unions do the work which keeps this party in power. We must do the work which removes this party from power. That's right. They have 40,000 members who work on campaigns. We have 600,000 gun owners in Connecticut, and united, we can easily do the work to win in November. We will reclaim Connecticut for the people. Now, today, we took an action, and we stand here as the many that came before us, as a as a people, we are only here for a short time, but we can be the change that we want to see. So many people have given their lives in defense of our freedoms, our liberty, and the American way of life. We cannot let them down, and we have to do the work so America moves forward. Yes, sir. Gun owners will be the difference in this state come November. I guarantee that. And I have, I have learned one person can make a difference. In the summer of 2015, I ran the election which helped the city of Norwich win a historic landslide election. 65 years of one party rule was swept out of office. An all new city council, treasurer and school board were seated. In the past several years, they've lowered the mill rate save the city of Norwich millions of dollars. And if it can happen in Norwich, it can happen in Hartford. It can happen in Waterbury. It can happen in Bridgeport. We have taken this state back for the people. Now, I'm asking you to get involved and help in the 2018 elections. We have to come together to defeat these people who are taking our rights and ruining our state. Gun owners can do the work. We can make the difference that must be done to save our families, our rights, and this state. I want you to know that by coming to this rally, you've already made a difference. By coming here with your fellow Americans, you have taken action toward protecting the right to keep and bear arms. Now let's keep this action going all the way to the voting booth in November. As Americans, we are the majority. As the citizens of this state, we demand representation here at the Capitol as the majority. Now, from my cold, dead hands! I just wanted to say that one time. Thank you very much for coming. And may God bless you and all your families, and God bless America. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, well, well, that was something. Thank you, Dan Newmeyer. Usually when Dan's on his give, give me liberty or give me death. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Usually when Dan does his show on the radio on the weekend, he's he's more of a DJ and he has more of that sleep, you know, eloquent yet sleepy voice. I never expected that, Dan Newmeyer. Thank you. I need everybody to raise your flags. This is an American rally here. All right. Founded was founded. We uh, we had our first rally here in Hartford back in uh, April of 2010, and we were small. 
and we were nowhere near uh, as influential as we try to be, which we were more influential, but if we get some more pro-gun legislators elected, we will be, and that's all up to you and me. There was a rally here at the Capitol, and one of the speakers, I was really not that acquainted with that much at the time, was here, and he wanted to talk about what he would do to protect us in Hartford if he were elected to office. And I'm proud to know this man, because here we are, nine years later, and he's here, and he's still a sitting state rep. Yeah. Please help me welcome one of our strongest voices in Hartford, yeah. from the 80th District, yeah. State Rep Rob Sampson. to do some tailoring. Good afternoon, everyone. A, a lot has happened since the first time I spoke at a CCDL rally back in 2010. For one thing, CCDL has now grown to nearly 30,000 members. Unfortunately, a lot of bad things have happened also. As we all know, our rights are under constant attack. The greatest threat to America is the gradual but steady loss of the values our country was founded upon, the lack of understanding of our own history by our neighbors, and the fact that our own government respects the authority of its citizens less and less every day. Indeed. The constant year-after-year year attempts to shrink our Second Amendment rights are the sad but undeniable proof of that. Our Second Amendment is possibly the most important piece of the United States Constitution. It is what defines us as free citizens. It is what says that we are individually sovereign, that we get to choose our own path in life and make our own decisions. It also says that we have the natural right to self-protection, that we have the right to defend ourselves and our property. Finally, and maybe most importantly, that we are in charge, and it is the government that is responsible to us. Yeah. Nowhere is the threat more evident than right here in Connecticut. Every year, there is another attempt by the people in the building right behind me to take more and more of our freedoms from us. They will never stop. But neither will we. This November, we have the best chance yet to reverse the course we are on and elect more friends to put inside this building working for us. And it is up to us, the people who understand what brought us here, who understand what is at stake, to stand up for our rights, to speak for them too, and to educate our fellow citizens. We need to reach out to our friends and neighbors and teach them the value of freedom and the Second Amendment. And most importantly, we need to get them out to vote. It is up to us to make that happen. I'm so proud. And I want to thank everyone who came out today to stand for my rights, for their rights, and to remind everyone here and elsewhere around watching us that we are not going away. I promise I'm not going away either. Thank you and God bless America. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Rob Sampson. He's the guy that you, when you put on CTN and watch the political garble going on in the background, that's there protecting our rights. Okay, so up next, we have, an, I would say, an activist who's a member of CCDL going way back. He does own a gun shop, but he's not here to really talk and promote his gun shop today, but he is well known by many in the northern part of the state. From Enfield, Connecticut, Tom Sarad. Yeah. 
Good afternoon. I'm Chuck. I'm from Enfield. My town is right next to the Massachusetts border. It's the gateway to the I-91 corridor. It's the central, it's the hub of North Central Connecticut. And it's right smack in the middle of what estimates say is two-thirds of all the legally owned firearms are in the state of Connecticut. Lately, every morning when I wake up, I find myself questioning what country I live in. As I drink my coffee and watch the news, someone else is seeking to restrict my rights, my rights to due process, my rights to freedom of assembly, my rights to freedom of speech, and my right to defend myself, my family, my property, and my state. Ten years ago, when we were all woken up from our little slumber, when we saw it coming on the horizon, we decided to take a stand. Every time some lunatic takes a firearm into a gun-free zone and does horrific things so as to punish people that bullied him or to become infamous in that 24-hour news cycle that is so desperately in need of ratings that they will wrench the name over and over again and poke and prod into that person's life. And every time I'm stuck, I'm denied my nature of sympathy and compassion for the victims, and I'm forced to say, when's it coming? Here they come again. How long before they seek to punish those who are the very definition of upstanding and law-abiding citizens because it's becoming a broken record? How long before they make me a felon with the stroke of a pen in the name of doing something? All of us, every single one of us, the very definition of upstanding citizen, in my case, I'm a decorated veteran of the United States Navy submarines. I served my town as an elected official. I served my town as an elected official for eight years. I hold an FFL and I'm licensed to carry in this damn state. I've passed more background checks than half the people at the higher rooms of government ever will. And I can prove it with my permit and my sales receipts. And you dare call me the problem. There are more firearms in this country than there are people in this country. There are trillions of rounds amongst us. If we were a problem, they'd know it. by buying the guy behind your coffee. That's who we are. But now it's time. As a former local elected official, I will tell you what we must do and we must push back. And I'm going to tell you how you push back. The very first question of anyone that's seeking any office, I don't care if it's dog catcher, is do you support my right to protect myself, my family, my property, and my state? 
And if they give you that answer that we've all heard, I do but. You walk away and find someone else. And when you do find that person, you crack open that wallet that we hate to crack open. You write that big check, you sign that piece of paper, and you work that campaign. And if you can't find someone, you do it. Because if you want to change the LOB, you got to start in your town. And then, what if you don't have the cause or you don't feel that you can and you go to your town meeting and let them know who you are? Because if you're in your town meeting and you ask them the same questions, watch them panic. Because they say we're only 43%, but because of who we are, we underreport. So when you leave today, Please, I beg of you, as someone from the front lines who helped a town in Massachusetts with your help stop a really, really bad law from happening in Long Meadow. 1,500 people standing outside a town hall. We can do that if we stick together. And you were there for me, and I am here for you, and they will be there for us too. Pay it forward. Push back. Thank you. left. Raise your flags. Come on! Okay, so let's bring out, or let's not bring out, but I would like to say, let's bring out Dan Malloy. Um, you know why I mentioned Dan Malloy's name? What did he call you all just about a month ago, a month and a half ago? Are you a what? No The least popular governor in all of America has declared that millions of us, Americans, are terrorists. Connecticut Governor Malloy believes that the more than 5 million law-abiding citizens of the NRA are terrorists. That's great. The same governor who wants to keep illegal immigrants here in Connecticut believes that legal citizens are the problem. Am I a terrorist? I'm a teacher. I'm a mom. I'm a father. I'm a veteran. I'm a physician. I'm a student. I'm a grandfather. I'm a paramedic. I'm a city firefighter. I'm a business owner. I'm a former combat medic. I am a public safety officer. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I work in an office. I sit next to you at our kids' soccer games. I go to church with you. We met in the hallway of our kids' school and we both are cupcakes for their birthdays. We smiled at each other while picking up oranges at the grocery store. I stand behind you in line every Monday morning at the coffee shop. We met at our grandkids' winter music performance. I met you at that neighborhood barbecue. I stopped when you had that flat tire and everyone else kept driving by. I'm a proud patriotic American. Am I a terrorist? 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 The NRA is comprised of over 5 million law-abiding citizens, including tens of thousands of Governor Malloy's constituents that he just called terrorists. Voters are fed up with politicians engaging in political stunts and childish name-calling, rather than serious policy discussion aimed at making our schools and communities safer. If you agree that supporting the Second Amendment doesn't make us terrorists, but rather makes us patriotic Americans, and share this video. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I have the distinct pleasure today to introduce to you, all the way from Washington, D.C., spokeswoman for the National Rifle Association, Katherine Mortensen, and our Connecticut lobbyist, John Weber. Please welcome them. Okay, 
Thank you. Hello. It is great to be here among friends. Or should I call you fellow terrorists? That is what the governor called us all last month. The truth is, the NRA is the largest and oldest civil rights organization in America. We fight for the rights of all Americans, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation, because the right to protect your life is the most precious right you have. And Governor Malloy should also know that no organization in the world does more than the NRA to promote the safe and responsible use of firearms. In fact, over the last 30 years, 30 million school children have gone through the NRA's Eddie Eagle Gun Avoidance Program. Thank you. And, you know, try calling up any one of these so-called gun safety groups, and I guarantee you they do not have a program like our Eddie Eagle program or our hunter safety program, not to mention all the other firearm safety courses we teach. In fact, one million law-abiding gun owners take an NRA firearm safety course every year. Now, that means we have about 118,000 NRA certified firearms instructors, and I know that some of you are here today are among the 3,000 NRA certified instructors here in Connecticut. I've taken some of your classes, and you are the gold standard in firearms training. The NRA represents more than 5 million Americans, tens and thousands of you right here in Connecticut, doctors, farmers, teachers, police officers, veterans. But does the governor really mean to call his constituents terrorists? No. Uh, we, we're here today because we love our country and the freedoms that make us great. And we're going to fight for the America that we believe in. Demonizing the millions of law-abiding gun owners in the National Rifle Association will not step, stop the next mass shooting. If anti-gun politicians and activists are truly committed to ending the violence, they must stop pointing fingers and come up with real solutions that address the underlying issues. A broken mental health system, a culture of violence, a NIC system that doesn't contain every record of those prohibited by federal law from owning, possessing, or purchasing a firearm. And let's be clear, the NRA does not want felons or the violently mentally ill to have access to firearms. But to focus on guns as the only factor will not make our communities any safer. The NRA believes that schools and local communities should be able to decide, decide for themselves the best way to protect students in classrooms. If a community wants to allow specially trained teachers to carry firearms in the classroom, that's a discussion they should have at the local level. <clears throat> We're committed to finding real solutions to keeping our children safe, and the gun control scheme of the week approach that's been used here in Connecticut is not the answer and it never has been. That approach punishes law-abiding gun owners for the acts of deranged criminals. And I'd like to paraphrase Mark Robinson. He's that gun rights supporter whose comments in Greensboro, North Carolina uh, went viral. He says, the law-abiding citizens of this community and the communities across our country are the first ones taxed and the last ones considered and the first ones punished when things like the Parkland shooting happen. Our rights are the ones taken away. And we are the majority. The majority of people in this country are law-abiding, and we want our constitutional right to bear arms. The law-abiding members of the NRA had nothing to do with the failure of the Parkland high school security preparedness, the failure of America's mental health system, the failure of the national instant check system, or the cruel failures of both federal and local law enforcement in that community. But anti-gun groups and politicians are quick to rush out their support for another failed gun ban. Gun bans don't work. We've been down that road before, and they do not prevent atrocities. The federal assault weapons ban was in place from 1994 to 2004 and a Justice Department study found that it had no discernible impact on crime. And in fact, I'm sure you'll remember this, it was during that ban that the shooting at Columbine High School happened. The key to preventing future tragedies is ensuring that prohibited people do not have access to any firearm 
not banning one firearm for all law-abiding people. Now here in Connecticut, some of your lawmakers are so misguided or confused about this that they are actually trying to ban an accessory to a firearm that is already banned. House Bill 5542, which was requested by Governor Malloy, could criminalize firearm modifications commonly done by law-abiding gun owners to make their firearms more suitable for self-defense, competition, hunting, or even overcoming a disability. And some lawmakers want to ban something that has never even been a problem in this state, the so-called ghost guns. House Bill 5540 would essentially end the centuries-old practice of manufacturing firearms for personal use by imposing requirements that far exceed those in federal law. The bill language is so broad that nearly any solid raw material could be considered a firearm. And yet, these same Connecticut lawmakers, when given the chance to put their money where their mouth is, chose not to. One legislative committee recently rejected an amendment to defund the bailout of Hartford and redirect that money instead to the Gun Trafficking Task Force, which was, all, which was only funded for one year following Sandy Hook. But seriously, that shows the utter hypocrisy of these gun control advocates. But it didn't stop there. That same committee also rejected an amendment that would have diverted money again to the Gun Trafficking Task Force instead of public campaign funds for bumper stickers and yard signs. So just to put a fine point on that, your anti-gun lawmakers would rather spend your tax dollars to pay for their campaign bumper stickers and yard signs than to pay for a task force whose mission is to enforce the state's possession and trafficking laws, specifically investigate illegal transfers, possessions, and transportation, and trace guns that law enforcement authorities seize. The voters are fed up with politicians who engage in political stunts and childish name-calling rather than serious policy discussions aimed at making our schools and communities safer. An example of a serious effort to make our schools safer is the Stop School Violence Act in Washington. The House passed it earlier this year. This bipartisan legislation provides funding for training students, teachers, school administrators, and local law enforcement to identify early warning signs that a person is a threat to themselves or others. Now this important bill will help stop school violence before it happens. Identifying individuals at risk for violence is a critical part of securing our schools. This bill will give communities the tools they need to stop school violence through early intervention. Now in addition to funding training, the Stop School Violence Act would fund school threat assessment procedures and create coordinated violence prevention reporting system. Now, a similar bill has been introduced in the Senate by Senator Orrin Hatch. The NRA supports both the House and the Senate bills. We must improve security in our schools, and this legislation will help make that happen. The NRA looks forward to seeing this passed quickly in the Senate so that President Trump can sign it into law. the gun control groups about the fake term common sense gun solutions is going. We have always known their end game. It is the repeal of the Second Amendment. And that's exactly what retired Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens called for a few weeks ago in a New York Times editorial. The 97-year-old retired justice has long held the opinion that American citizens do not have the individual right to own a firearm for self-protection. Emboldened by the mainstream media, the gun control lobby is no longer distancing themselves from the radical idea of repealing the Second Amendment and banning all firearms. The protests at last month's big gun control march told us that, with their words and their placards, that the current debate is not about common sense gun regulation. It is about banning all guns. The men and women of the National Rifle Association, along with the majority of the American people and the Supreme Court, believe in the Second Amendment right to self-protection. And we will unapologetically continue to fight to protect this fundamental freedom. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and, and let me be absolutely clear, attempts to demonize law-abiding gun owners and NRA members by
by threatening the loss of corporate discounts or partnerships will neither scare nor distract one single NRA member from our mission to stand and defend the individual freedoms that have always made America the greatest nation in the world. Thank you. And finally, thank you very much to all the Connecticut Citizens Defense League members. You have been absolute superstars in this fight with us. You've been an inspiration to Second Amendment supporters across the country. You've made your voices heard in town hall meetings in your state capitals, in the calls of Congress, and your recent social media campaign that we just heard that Holly Sullivan and others worked on um, asking Governor Malloy if you are terrorists was absolutely brilliant and a model for others around the country. Thank you all for what you're doing. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Catherine Mortensen and our state lobbyist, John Weber. Let's give it up! We're winding down here, folks, and, uh, you know, I want to I introduce this next speaker. Uh, he is state rep, from, uh, state rep from the House District 47, and he is somebody that's going to tell us all what we need to hear. And so please, as our closing speaker, I want you to listen. Before we drift off, I want you to listen. His message is, is, is very important. So please help me welcome to the podium, State Rep from the 47th House District, Doug Dubitsky. Yeah. I'm in the safest place in Connecticut. Because of our wonderful Capitol Police, the best police force in the state. Give them a big cheer. Thank you, guys. And because of 5,000 legally armed good guys. That's right. Now, earlier I heard the, the uh, chant, vote them out. Well, remember, there's a couple of good guys up there, too. Remember, remember the people who were here before. We got Ann Dauphiné, we got Rob Sampson, Craig Fishbein, Dave Wilson, uh, Scott Storms, Greg Stokes, and of course me, Doug Dubitsky. We also have, look around, you see any gubernatorial candidates? We got one, Peter Lamage, the only guy here. Right over there. Let me ask you something. The government announced today that it would no longer adhere to the Constitution, that it would no longer protect the rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights, and that it would be a felony felony to attend the church, to preach the gospel, to practice your religion, what would you do? That's right. You'd get up from your keyboard, we'd organize, we'd campaign, we'd march on Washington, we'd protest, we'd engage in civil disobedience. We would devote ourselves and our energies to protecting our country and our people. The government sent troopers door to door to confiscate every privately owned firearm in this country. What would you do? That's right. You'd probably skip the opening day of fishing season, right? Yeah, we'd, we'd resist. We would not comply, right? We would join together and organize to fight the oppression, right? If a foreign enemy sought to strip Americans of our God-given rights, sought to criminalize free speech, sought to reimpose slavery, sought to seize our lands and our property, we would fight to the death 
to protect our nation and our Constitution, right? Millions of Americans have fought. Many have died or been injured for that very thing since our founding. And now we have well-funded special interest groups trying to force the government to ignore the U.S. Constitution, to ignore the Connecticut Constitution, to strip you of your God-given rights with the threat of prison, they threaten to seize your property, and they, they, they threaten to prevent you from protecting yourself and your family. Now, it may not be as sudden as a presidential edict or as dramatic as a foreign invasion. It might not be as startling as a knock on the door in the middle of the night. But make no mistake, your constitutional rights are under direct attack. Now, it used to be that those who hate the Constitution would conceal their intentions. They claimed that they supported the Constitution. They claimed that they were supporters of the Second Amendment, but they'd always say that. I support the Second Amendment, but they just wanted to keep the guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them, of course. They just want, they were just trying to keep the children safe, of course. They just wanted common sense gun control, of course. They played these word games to hide their intentions. They stopped calling it gun control. They started saying gun safety legislation. They claimed they wanted to prevent gun violence. They at the same time, they were focusing all their attacks on exclusively on the one group of people who is the most law-abiding and least violent group of individuals in our society. You. That's right. And at the same time, they use these bullying tactics and economic terrorism to demonize and damage true gun safety programs. The NRA uh, representative earlier talked about the Eddie Eagle program. And there's Boy Scout programs and school safety programs. They're all under attack. Well, recently, however, the people who hate the Constitution have dropped all pretense. They're out of closet now. They, the fan dance is over. Everything is open to view. They're emboldened, and they no longer feel that they need to hide their intentions. They're finally telling us exactly what they've wanted this entire time. They want you to be disarmed. No way. And it, it's very simple. They want to ignore, repeal, and destroy the Constitution. That is their goal. That's their open stated goal now. They are, they are, there were signs all over the, the previous protests that said just that. They want the iron fist of government to keep the guns out of your hands because they think you are the ones who shouldn't have them. And they're shamelessly exploiting every tragedy and every murdered child to paint you as the criminals for daring to oppose their mob attack on the Constitution and your individual freedom. Now, the question is no longer if their goal is to destroy the Second Amendment. They've admitted it was. And as the NRA rep said, talk about uh, Justice, former Justice Stevens, who admitted the goal is to repeal. And they're looking to circumvent the Constitution because repeal is hard. It's tough to repeal the Constitution. It's tough to repeal the Bill of Rights. Our founders made it deliberately hard. They made it hard on purpose to avoid just this circumstance. So what are they doing instead? They're trying to go around it. Look at what they're doing with regard to, to the um, Electoral College. They can't repeal the Electoral College, so they're talking about national popular vote legislation. 
a way around it. They, they're pissed off that immigration is exclusively in federal power. So what are they doing? They're just ignoring it. They're ignoring the constitutional provision to give the federal government that power. And they're trying to have sanctuary cities where we just ignore federal law. And, and they don't like people exercising their Second Amendment rights, so they bully and intimidate people and companies to believe what they believe. Look what happened at the AquaTurf. They are trying to use the iron fist of government to impose their will. Look, we have a, a candidate for governor, a Democratic candidate for governor, who at a public hearing stood up and said that he wants government to force private companies to stop doing business with anyone who sells products that are constitutionally protected by the state and federal constitution. Folks, that is fascism. Pure and simple. Fascism. Look, it's easy to, re it's easy to just reflexively blame guns. It's easy. It's simple. It doesn't take any thinking. It doesn't take any brain power to think about the real causes of violence in our society. It furthers the progressive ideal of an unarmed citizenry. And they can claim victory just by taking guns away from you. They don't have to do the hard work of actually reducing crime. They just have to take your guns away to be successful. And at the same time, they reject all real proposals that will stop the carnage in our cities. And they ignore and belittle any real proposal to make our schools safe. Plus, till recently, you didn't yell and scream, and you don't get violent like they do. <laughs> Folks. Right. If you want to protect our society and our constitutional rights for the next generation, for the kids that were up here earlier, it's time to get serious. It is time to get serious and start fighting back. It is time to start organizing. Give CCDL all the credit in the world. These guys do a fabulous, fabulous job. You know, Pulling off something like this year after year and, and working and fighting uh, bad bills and bad legislation and bad court decisions doesn't happen by itself. It takes the NRA, it takes the CCDL, and it takes you to be together, to work together to do this stuff. Now, when we fight, we do it peacefully. We do it civilly. We don't engage in the violence that the other side does. But we still have to fight nonetheless. And because our constitutional rights are under attack, and no less under attack than if fascist troops were landing troops at, the, at our beaches, and they were sending their stormtroopers to every one of your doors, we still need to fight. So let me ask you one question. What are you prepared to do about it? Fight! 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 That's not very loud. What are you prepared to do about it? Citizens Defense League up near this podium right now. 
Please come on up here.